Hello everybody, welcome back to the Praetorium. Before I get started, I'd like to start off with my usual introductory strict statement. Thanks, thank everybody for listening, and we appreciate all the likes and subscribes, and we'd also appreciate it if you could share these posts. The reason why it's so important to share these posts is because the Praetorium is... 100% organic reach, that means that we do not pay for boosts, we do not pay for subscribers or likes, this is 100% organic, and we take pride in that. We wish to bring information to people with as little money involved, make it as free and cheap as possible for everybody. We don't support Patreon and people having to pay for any kind of information in the media that most of the supposed alternative media sources claim that they believe in. So by doing this, we believe that it's actually working on the problem when it comes to internet alternative media and it's not hiding our heads in the sand so that's why we do this so if you could please like subscribe and share we greatly appreciate it with all that said let's continue with the topic thank you I go further and affirm the Bill of Rights in the sense and in the extent in which they are contended for are not only unnecessary in the purpose of the Constitution, but would even be dangerous. They would contain various exceptions to powers which are not granted and on this very account would afford colorable pretext to claim more than we granted for why declare that things shall not be done which this is no power to do why for instance should it be said that the liberty of the press should not be restrained when no power is given by which restrictions may be opposed I would not contend that such a provision would confer a regulating powers but it is evident that it would furnish to men disposed to usurp a plausible pretest for claiming that power Alexander Hamilton, Federalist Number 84, 575, 581, 28 May 1788. Supporters of the Bill of Rights argued that a list of rights would and should not be interpreted as ex exhaustive, i.e., that these rights were examples of important rights that people had, but that people had other rights as well. People in this school of thought were confident that the judiciary would interpret these rights in an expansive fashion. John Jay was an American statesman, patriot, di diplomat, founding father of the United States, signer of the Treaty of Paris, and the first Chief Justice of the United States between 1789 to 1795. Jay was born into a wealthy family of merchants and government officials in New York City. He became a lawyer and joined the New York Committee of Correspondence and organized opposition to British rule. He joined a conservative political faction that feared mob rule, sought to protect properties, rights, and maintain the rule of law while resisting British violations of human rights. Jay served as the president of the 
Continental Congress between 1778 and 79, an honorable position with little power. During and after the American Revolution, Jay was a minister or ambassador to Spain, France, and Secretary of Foreign Affairs, helping to fashion United States foreign policy. His major diplomatic achievement was to negotiate favor tr favorable trade terms with Great Britain and in the Treaty of London in 1794 when he was still serving as Supreme Court Chief Justice, Jay, a proponent of strong centralized government, worked to ratify the new constitution in the New York in New York in 1788 by pseudonymously writing five of the Federalist Papers along with the main authors Alexander Hamilton and James Madison. As a leader of the new Federalist Party, Jay was the governor of New York State between 1795 and 1801 where he became the state's leading opponent of slavery. His first two attempts to end slavery in New York in 1777 and 1785 failed, but a third in 1799 succeeded. The 1799 Act, a gradual emancipation he signed into law, eventually gave all slaves in New York their freedom before his death in 1829. Having established a reputation as a reasonable moderate in New York, Jay was elected to serve as a delegate to the First and Second Continental Congress, which debated whether the colonies should declare independence. He attempted to reconcile the colonies with Britain up until the Declaration of Independence. Jay's views became more radical as events unfolded. He became an ardent separatist and attempted to move New York towards that cause. On June 23, 1782, Jay reached Paris where negotiations to the American Revolutionary War would take place. Benjamin Franklin was the most experienced diplomat of the group and thus Jay wished to lodge near him in order to learn from him. The United States agreed to negotiate with Britain separately than with France. In July 1782, the Earl of Shelburne offered, offered the Americans independence, but Jay rejected the offer on the grounds that it did not recognize American independence during the negotiations. Jay's dissent halted negotiations and the final treaty dictated that the United States would have Newfoundland fishing rights. Britain would acknowledge the United States as independent and would withdraw its troops in exchange for the United States ending the seizure of loyalist property and honoring private debts. The treaty granted the United States independence but left many border regions in dispute and many of its provisions were not enforced. Jay believed his responsibility was not matched by a commensurate level of authority so he joined Alexander Hamilton and James Madison in advocating for a stronger government from that of the one dictated by the Articles of Confederation. He argued in his address to the people of the state of New York on the subject of the federal constitution that the Articles of Confederations were too weak and an ineffective form of government. He contended that the, con the Congress under the Articles of Confederation may make war but are not empowered to raise men or money to carry it on. They may make peace, but without power to see the terms of, its, of it observed. They may form affiliations, but without ability to comply with the stipulations on their part. They may enter into tre treaties of commerce, but without power to enforce them at home or abroad. In short, they may consult 
and deliberate and recommend and make requisitions and they who please may regard them. In September of 1789 George Washington offered the position of Secretary of State which though technically a new position would be continued Jay's service as Secretary of Foreign Affairs he declined. Washington responded by offering him the new title which Washington stated must be regarded as the keystone of our political fabric as Chief Justice of the United States which Jay accepted Washington officially nominated Jay on September the 24th 1789 the same day he signed the Judiciary Act of 1789 which created the position of Chief Justice in the law Jay unanimously confirmed by the United States Senate in September the 26th 1789 and received his commission the same day his term began with his taking the oath of office on October the 19th 1789 Washington also nominated John Blair William Cushing James Wilson Robert Harrison and John Rutledge as associated judges Harrison declined the appointment however and Washington appointed James Iredell to fill the final seat of the court. All right, we have come to the end of our 15 minutes, so I'm going to stop here and I will get back to this later on at a better time. I would like to say again. Thank you for listening and have a good night. Have a good day. Thank you.